Thank you very much. Uh, and I, I would like to thank the organizers for their kind invitation to speak in this conference. Uh, so <clears throat> even though this conference is focuses on the BSD conjecture, uh, I will be talking about modular forms. But I think I'm not far away. So uh, anyway, I will, uh, <clears throat> in the first part of the talk, I will say something uh, you know, about uh, uh, the, this relation between uh, you know, this non-vanishing business. And in the last part, I will discuss some specialized results. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so, simultaneous non-vanishing of L functions. So, I'd like to uh, first discuss why the simultaneous uh, non-vanishing uh, is interesting. Okay. Okay. So, so that will do. First, let me uh, just give you what ultimately I'm going to discuss, or what is the main result that I want to present in this talk. <clears throat> the main result would be a result, the that I want to uh, present today uh, is about uh, the statement that if you take the Dirichlet L function, L S chi, and <clears throat> suppose the functional equation relates, uh, of it relates S to minus S, uh, 1 minus S, so the central point is half, and if you take a modular form and twist it by this character, so my main aim of this talk is to study the non-vanishing, simultaneous non-vanishing of this for how many ka or which ka is. So this is my uh, goal of this talk, but that will come at the end. So I just, but I just want, don't want to mislead you or anything. So this is what I'm going to talk. So time to, uh, so, but in the first half, I will just make a little survey or, or this non-vanishing things. Here, F is a mass form, yeah? But I will discuss about holomorphic case also, but F could be holomorphic or mass. Or, so this real analytic or holomorphic, any, any one of these two. So I'll focus on this. <coughs> okay, so this will be the last part. So let me, uh, to put things into perspective, so let us recall some well-known results and conjectures about non-vanishing of L functions. So indeed, if E over Q is an elliptic curve, I mean, and the BSD conjecture is about a non-vanishing, vanishing or non-vanishing statement, right? So, yeah, so, <clears throat> which is the theme of this conference, is a statement about <clears throat> the vanishing or non-vanishing of, you know, the central point, and, and its relation with the rank of E. <clears throat> so non-vanishing is already in the picture. <clears throat> Moreover, if you consider this KQ rational points of E, where KQ is nothing but the cyclotomic field, where Q is the odd prime, suppose. Throughout this lecture, Q would be an odd prime. <coughs> yeah, rank. <coughs> if you, then if you consider the, uh, if you consider this, then uh, you have to consider the L function E over KQ, and this factorizes as a product, chi mod Q of the twists. Where, you know, this twist itself has been introduced, Somna told me, so this, uh, where uh, if you have a Dirichlet series, more gen if you have just a Dirichlet series, ds is a n n to the power minus s, the twist 
of d, let's say I write it like this, is nothing but you throw in the character in, in the definition. Right? So it makes, so this uh, twisted L functions also come into the picture, and I, I also have these twisted L functions. So, nice. Okay. <coughs> So therefore, uh, the vanishing or non-vanishing of this function is therefore related with the vanishing and non-vanishing of this bunch of products. So the analytic rank is therefore the summation of chi mod q, order s equals to one of this, these things. E. Now this can be now translated into a question in analytic number theory. Analytic number theory gives you that each of these things is bounded by log q. O of log q. This follows from standard L function theory, explicit formulas and all that. <laughs> from standard L function theory, this follows from analytic theory of L functions. So in total, this thing is bounded by Q log Q, because there are phi Q terms. <coughs> okay. <coughs> now, yeah, so therefore, One is led to studying the set of all chi's mod q, chi is the Dirichlet character, such that this twist one doesn't vanish or vanishes, whatever, complementary set, whatever it is. <coughs> So I want to get as many chi's as possible, such that uh, these twists are non-zero. So <clears throat> Indeed, this is, there is a theorem due to Stefanicki. I forgot the year, but uh, he proved that this will be q by log q. As q goes to, q goes to infinity. <clears throat> so this was known uh, I think 1980s or something, I forgot. Now, of course, much better results are known. I'll come to that towards the end. But this is what uh, people proved, maybe 1980s. <coughs> okay. <coughs> okay, so we are, uh, so therefore, therefore uh, this non-vanishing of twists are also important. And so what I will do now is I will discuss uh, uh, the aspect of simultaneous non-vanishing, okay? <clears throat> yeah. Ah, so I will come. So here, chi is varying, so I will slowly move and change my family. Uh, so I will change my family to, uh, uh, I will index my family with chi, ultimately. Now it is indexed by E or F. Now I will change it and, yeah. Indexing uh, by the f by f is, is uh, in, uh, in some way easier in the uh, in the view from the viewpoint of analytic number theory because you have Peterson trace formula. When you sum over f, you have Peterson trace formula, right? Which you, if you sum over chi, you do not have. So in a sense, that is easier. So. I want to discuss a result due to UNH and Sarnak uh, about simultaneous non vanishing. <coughs> so, let, yeah, so, yeah, so I am switching now from elliptic curves to modular forms. So, there is no harm because we have the modularity theorem. Every elliptic curve is modular and so their L functions match. So, there is, there is no harm in doing that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, the order, the, the order of vanishing itself will be bounded. That's because 
<coughs> I mean, that's standard theory. So you can count the number of zeros of this L function uh, with, let's say, rho equal to on the, half, on the line half, on the line half plus, let's say, i gamma, and mod gamma minus some bounded quantity t less than 1, that you know is bounded by log of the conductor and some, whatever. Here it will be q. Yes, yes. <coughs> so the parameter is q. Yeah. Yeah, there is some factor depending on e also, but that's bounded. Etc. <coughs> That's completely standard. So, uh, so I'm passing to modular forms. By modular theorem. E is related to Fe. It's 2 gamma 0 n. <coughs> and their L functions match. there is no harm. <clears throat> and more generally, I will consider any bet, not only two. So more generally, consider these problems or questions. For SK gamma zero. <clears throat> Okay, so now let F be a modular form. Which is a new form. This means that the Fourier coefficients are multiplicative in particular. And it also means that the functional equation relates, uh, of course there is functional equation taking S to K minus S, and it, and it, uh, and it, it relates the L function of F to itself not of the dual. I mean, it's a new form. So, so that's the advantage of dealing with new form. <coughs> and so we want to study the central value. <coughs> it's a theorem. Uh, one has to start with that the central value, I am writing half because I have normalized my L function in such a way that the functional equation is now from S to 1 minus S. I just divided by Fourier coefficient by a certain uh, n to the k minus 1 by 2. So I get my functional equation from s to 1 minus s, and half is the central point. Not only f, but if I twist f by a real uh, digital character, this central values are non-negative, always. That's a remarkable statement, right? We want them to be non-zero, that's our goal, but, to st but it's known that they're non-negative for all real characters, chi d. Chi d is the Kronecker signal attached to a fundamental discriminant d. <clears throat> or the character corresponding to the quadratic field. Fundamental discriminant d. How do we prove this? Well, this is the famous theorem of waltz purge Conan Zagier, etc. That's one way. Roughly, or in short, what you do is you look at the Shimura map, right? You look at, look at the Shimura map. So there is a certain map. Recall, so to get this, recall uh, there exists, uh, recall for uh, there is a, of course, there is a Shimura map. I won't define it. So there exists a G in the condensed plus plus space, and I will make it two so that I can write k plus half. Doesn't matter so much. And uh, yeah, then this will be 
uh, 4n. Let's make it 4n just to make the levels on the things. Uh, this is related to f such that just there is a map, but the point is that uh, the Fourier coefficients of g, let's call them b. Okay, let's write g to be summation of bn q to the n, b of n q to the n. Then this implies that uh, the dth Fourier coefficient, b of d square, okay, this is essentially <coughs> lf, l half, f tensor chi d. Well, I have written this tilde, this tilde means up to some uh, uh, some numbers, Peterson norms and etc. but this is positive. Whatever is there, it's positive. <clears throat> so you can see the central L value is positive. It's the square of a real number. <clears throat> Sorry, yeah, of course, mod. The square of a real number, yes, it's, it's positive. <clears throat> Non-negative. We want it to be positive, but that's a different question, so I'll come to that. But we start with, we have all of this non-negative. That's something. Yeah, n is odd and square free. That I have not mentioned, yeah. n1 or odd square free. Thanks. <coughs> Now, now I come to a uh, uh, very uh, beautiful observation by Ivan H. and Sarnak. In their famous uh, paper in 2000 in the Israel Journal. So, yeah, it's a very famous paper. So, <clears throat> so what is the observation? In a nutshell, it says that uh, if we have simultaneous non-vanishing for certain families, then that rules out the possibility of uh, landau siegel zero for Dirichlet L functions. That's something non-trivial. So, I'm, I'll explain these things. So, I'll state some facts. <clears throat> the percentage of new f new forms in SK1, of course, I mean, these are just uh, level one forms uh, with uh, k varying up to k. k. Capital K is some parameter, big parameter, which is going to infinity. The percentage of new forms in SK and also if k varies up to k, so there are two, uh, two uh, what do you call, um, averages. One, f is already varying here, and k is also going up to k. So there are two averages. <coughs> Such that L half f is greater or equal to log k inverse, small k, okay, small k, inverse is at least 50%. Is at least uh, um, percentage is a so at least uh, half of the uh, uh, modular forms in this family uh, satisfy this lower bound. So that's what that's fact number one. Fact number two is the level aspect. You fix k and suppose you take a level and let the level vary. <coughs> so percentage of new forms. F in SK gamma zero n <coughs> such that L half F is greater than log n inverse. Oh, sorry. Ah, sorry, these are not inverses but inverse squares. Okay, whatever it is. <coughs> Number of such F is again at least fifty percent. Here, k is fixed, n 
one or square free, etc. So there are some technical conditions. There are some other technical conditions. I'm not going to write uh, chi real. Ah, uh, sorry. Uh, I can also put a chi here for a fixed chi. Chi real, fixed. Don't worry too much. I just uh, some family. I'm I'm looking at such as some family, and inside that family, I'm saying so so much half of the person half of the times the L functions have a moderate lower bound. That's all it is. Yeah. Capital Q. Which one? Uh, log k to the power minus two. Small k. Small k. <coughs> Yeah. Yeah, n is varying. n is going to infinity. Uh, so you should write as n tends to infinity. Chi is fixed. Chi, is, chi has some uh, conductor chi. So chi, has, chi has some conductor q, which is co-prime to n. That's it. As I said, this is not completely uh, correct. There are some other technical conditions. I think n should be all of the same order as phi of n or something. But this is the essence. I uh, so so I got to. So then at least fifty percent. That's the point. Now what you are, what these people say is that if at least one of these percentages crosses fifty percent among these two sets, if one of these percentages crosses fifty percent, then very strangely, then this for this chi. This chi will have no Landau sequence zero. It's, yeah, it's very strange. <coughs> you can look at that paper yeah, and see in more details. I think they have not supplied proofs completely. Whatever. So, so what they say is the following: If any one of the proportions. is bigger than half, strictly bigger than half, then this, this L half, of course, you have to apply these proportions to appropriate families, OK? You have to apply this to appropriate families, which involve chi, OK? So this L, uh, not L half chi, this L S chi uh, would not any Siegel 0. Recall that means that. Uh, Siegel zero means a zero in the interval one minus some constant by log q up to one. So there is, so so that such a zero doesn't exist. That's a big problem, big question. So this is another way of attacking this uh, Siegel problem, Siegel Siegel zero problem. Unfortunately, we do not know whether any of this crosses fifty percent. It is not known. But if known, then it will give an answer. That's what it is. <coughs> So, so what I want to say, therefore, uh, I just wanted to uh, say that this, therefore, this simultaneous non-vanishing business is interesting. That's because, uh, in order to prove this, whatever this uh, thing about Siegel zero, they consider a sum of of the following form. They throw in some uh, spectral weight, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they prove that under certain choices of A, F, and whatever, certain families, uh, this is either asymptotic to n times L1 chi, et cetera. Essentially, they, they have a bunch of you know, families. You have to apply this to suitable families. I'm sorry, here F is very. F is very. <coughs> So what they say is that if uh, these lower bounds uh, hold for hold very frequently, at least more than 50 percent, then what will happen is the is that uh, this the set of non-vanishing you know here and the set of non-vanishing here will have an unempty inter intersection. If one of the one, one of the proportions is greater than half, there will be an intersection, and in the intersection you have good lower bounds, and this lower bound will give a lower bound for L1. And once you have a good lower bound for L1 chi, you can rule out the sequence. So that's essentially the idea. So I, all I want to say that therefore simultaneous non-vanishing is interesting. So <clears throat> uh, 
Yeah, I, I don't want to specify. Yeah, you, you have to see the paper. There are several choices of this family. So inside a family, inside some families. Yeah, finite families. Some of our HK bases. All kinds of HK bases and all that. Once, once you keep K fixed and vary over the level, when you fix, fix the level and vary over the weight, something like that. <coughs> so this, this is how uh, uh, the business about simultaneous non-vanishing gains some importance. And so now I will move on to some more uh, results. <coughs> so we would now be interested in the family. Um, yeah, L half uh, chi times L half tensor chi. Where chi is very. So now we switch our family. Instead of F varying, we now have chi varying. So we'll study this family. Okay. So I want to study how how many pro what is the proportion of directly characters of a certain modulus for which this. There is simultaneous non-vanishing. This value. <clears throat> okay. So first, let us recall a result due to uh, chinta. Uh, chinta. So here k is equal to two. So we are in the case of elliptic modular forms. So if f is a modular form, a new form of weight two of some level n, then uh, uh, a new form. Then uh, he says that uh, he says about uh, in terms of elliptic curves, but uh, it's, it's fine. So number of characters chi mod q such that L f Sometimes I write f tensor chi, sometimes I write f comma chi comma half, so they are the same. Uh, equal to zero, this set, the number of characters mod q for which the central value vanishes is bounded by f q to the power 7 by 8 for every epsilon positive. So therefore, we have 100% non vanishing. So the complementary set is q minus q to the power 7 over 8, which is Essentially, 100% uh, non-vanishing in terms in, in terms of asymptotics. Right? <clears throat> Asymptotically. <clears throat> okay. So. <clears throat> How does it prove this? Well, uh, yeah, so I'll come to that. But this implies, first of all, note that the set of chi mod q for which L half chi times L half f, uh, sometimes, yeah. Again, I have changed my variables. Yeah. Please pardon me for that. I've taken the half in the front. Oh. Myself is comp I'm confused. So anyway, so uh, this is non-zero. <clears throat> uh, uh, this is for a positive proportion. This uh, this set has positive proportion. That's very simple, right? Well, this is the intersection of two sets, of which one of them is hundred percent. Now, and we also know that the proportion of chi is for which L of chi is non-zero also has a positive proportion. There there are many results. So definitely, this is this is positive proportion, right? You just use set theory. In uh, a intersection, b is a plus b minus whatever union something. So <clears throat> this is positive proportion. So in this case, this simultaneous non-vanishing has a good answer. But the point is, uh, uh, Chinta uses algebraic techniques. So in particular, what he uses is that uh, Chinta and other people like Rolrick and uh, these people, um, they use the Essentially, some algebraic input uh, uses that. You know, he works with elliptic curves. It's, it's the same. So, e comma half 
uh, is non-zero if and only if Le comma chi sigma half is non-zero for Le sigma in the Galois group, right? So, <coughs> so this is crucially used. What is sorry? Ah, uh, non-zero, non-zero. Yeah, either zero or non-zero, whatever. One is non-zero, the other is non other is non-zero. And what it does is sum over the Galois orbits. And so this is algebraic. So what, what, what is so what is the story when there is no such you know algebraic uh, 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 input? So for example, mass forms. <coughs> yeah. So the <coughs> so the number of chi for which uh, it vanishes is bounded by this. So number of chi for which it doesn't vanish is greater or equal to q minus q to the power 7 over 8. So this is q. So, uh, so what is the peak, what is the story? There is no such algebraic, uh, you know, uh, input. So there, so that's that essentially uh, the case of mass forms. I won't define what mass forms are, uh, uh, but there are certain real analytic objects, and which are, uh, you know, which uh, <coughs> has certain transformation pro property under a discrete subgroup. They are, you know, eigenfunctions of the Laplacian, and I will also assume that they are uh, Hecke eigen Hecke eigen forms. So <clears throat> there is a parallel theory of Hecke operators there. I won't recall them. So uh, so we uh, want to see what happens when such algebraic techniques or inputs are not available. That is, for example, in the case of mass forms. In this connection, there is a result due to Senchi Liu, which states, which is the following. His result is quite general. I am stating it in a restricted fashion. So, uh, so let so this is a result due to Senchi Liu, which says. <clears throat> That if if is a new form. So for simplicity, I will I will take the full modular group, uh, either holomorphic or mass doesn't matter. On SL to Z, let's say. This result is true for arbitrary, you know, automorphic representation for GL two. Uh, Liu. Uh. <coughs> so he proves the following. Uh, this was our so kind of motivation to, uh, I mean, study whatever I wrote in the f in the beginning of the talk. So he proves the following result. So let F be a new form like this. Given a large number R there exist a directly character chi mod R where R is anything between capital R and 4R. I don't know what it is. That's the problem. That's the, uh, that that's really is the problem such that we have simultaneous non vanishing Here, yeah, so we have no simultaneous non vanishing And so the point is the main drawback of this result is that I do not know for which modulus. There is, it's a range, and for some modulus in this range, we have some character for which it doesn't vanish. It doesn't specify the range, right? It doesn't specify the modulus. This does not specify the modulus. 
you're given this large number r, but you, you cannot say which uh, <coughs> modulus you're choosing inside this range. So he gets this problem because, because of the following. He considers the sum I will say what this complicated set D is. Uh, I, I actually, I will not say. It's very. It's rather complicated. So, I'll just indicate its order and all that. I order. I even <coughs> L half chi, and times of course uh, you have to sum up what you want to prove. You want to prove the simultaneous non-vanishing, so you sum up, and I want to uh, give an asymptotic formula. That's what it does, etc. etc. There is some error term. It's not so important. It is something. So for every epsilon positive, etc. One has this asymptotic formula, and from this asymptotic formula, uh, you can immediately deduce the previous uh, non-vanishing result. <coughs> The point is there is a double sum. Because of this double sum, you cannot specify for which r, because there is an extra summation over r. Right? <coughs> so that's the problem. I won't tell you what d is. d is a certain complicated set. And uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, I don't even, oh, I'll not say what it is. I will just say that. Uh, uh, D is a certain subset of this interval R to 4R. And the cardinality of this set D is uh, R by log R or something, log R square. So anyway, so this is what uh, brought us uh, to the uh, problem of studying this question for mass forms. Mm. As I said, uh, this question is almost trivial as we saw in the other board. If I take f to be a new form of weight 2 coming from an elliptic curve, we saw there is 100%, almost 100% almost non-vanishing. I do not know of this result, if this result holds for higher degree modular forms, uh, not of weight 2, maybe for higher weights, I'm not sure. Uh, that I'm not sure. <coughs> but uh, I'll, I guess so. <coughs> so what we prove is the following. So we what we do essentially we for we remove this extra summation so and then get a better result <coughs> the theorem this is joint with this one who can <coughs> so we prove uh, we simply sum over all primitive characters this term means primitive and q is a prime throughout uh, this talk, I sum up L half chi, tensor chi, but not quite. The main problem that this guy essentially faced uh, because uh, was that, uh, yeah, let me say he faced uh, some technical problems. He, he uh, you know, he wanted to prove this asymptotic in, in course of the analysis, he um, got something called the, what is called the cube of the Gauss sum. You know, this functional equation of these objects have Gauss sums. And when you do the analysis, you need to multiply many Gauss sums. The more you multiply, the more disadvantages the things become. So this guy, so this L half chi has a Gauss sum, Gauss sum, and this has a Gauss sum square in the functional equation, essentially, right? So when you multiply, you get a cube. And once you have a cube, the trouble starts. Um, uh, I would like to say that uh, this can be reserved at the, uh, by using very high kind of machinery. But uh, at, the, at the time that we wrote this paper, it was not available. So what we do is we employ a very simple trick. We put a bar here. This doesn't change my study of simultaneous non-vanishing. If L of chi is non-zero, L of chi bar is also non-zero. right? And L half chi bar is L half of chi bar. Right? So, so I, I'm in good shape. And uh, not only that, now this becomes chi bar, and I have a tau chi square, so one of them will cancel. 
you know, when I multiply. There will be no cube, so I'll be saved. So that's essentially the idea, and nothing more. But such simple ideas, you know, uh, do sim simplify things. So, so this is the exact asymptotic, L1F, which is non-zero, that we all know. <clears throat> Plus there is some error term. I will say what these are. So this is true for if a Heke mass form. On SL to Z, Q is a prime tending to infinity. And theta is the best exponent towards the Ramanujan conjecture. <coughs> For mass forms. So currently we can take theta to be 7 by 64. So if you, yeah, you can put that value if you want. <clears throat> okay, so uh, as I said, I have already told the basic idea, so now it's just a, a matter of carrying out the details. So <clears throat> So what I will do, since, uh, yeah, so uh, I will not, uh, you know, uh, explain the whole uh, course of the proof. So I will uh, first uh, deduce a corollary. Corollary is very simple, uh, it's, uh, it's just uh, one line. So I want to count, uh, I think, uh, yeah, essentially. I want to, yeah, from this information, I want to count uh, what is the proportion or what, what what is the number of chi for which, you know, this is uh, the simultaneous non-vanishing. So that's very easy. From the above asymptotic, One can easily prove that the number of characters chi for which both of these L, central L values now doesn't vanish. Yeah. L value at 1, is, which is non-zero. L value is at, zeta function is also non-zero at L equals to, uh, S equals to 1, right? So one can prove it for any automorphic form, yeah. So it's non-zero. Yeah, so normalization is S goes to 1 minus S, always. So half is the central point and 1 is at the. <coughs> so uh, non-zero, this you can calculate. There is some bound. Ah. These numbers are not important. It's just that it is q to the power something. Q to the power some delta. <coughs> this you can easy, very easily prove. So let me show you how. It is it's, it's essentially very simple. So I have this asymptotic. So I'm just writing that sum over chi, that asymptotic. That asymptotic is bigger than q, for q large enough. Right? Because I have, because I have an asymptotic. So it's bigger than q. <coughs> Now, yeah, so but this is also less, less than equal to, uh, yeah. So let me call this number to be A. So therefore this sum is less than A times uh, upper bounds for these L functions. So, so I will just write the upper bounds for the uh, skew to the power 3 by 16 for LS L half chi, it's a Burgess bound. You, any, even the convexity bound will suffice. Even the convexity bound will suffice. So L half is less than Q to the power three by 16. And L of F tensor chi also has a convexity bound and a subconvex bound. So I'm using the subconvex bound here. Uh, 
I'll just write it like this, minus 1 over 8, 1 minus 2 theta. Again, theta is the exponent towards the Ramanujan's conjecture. <coughs> and how do I get this? Well, L half F tensor chi is also known to be bounded by this quantity, by work of several authors, Blomar, etc. As I said, you could have taken the convexity bounds. Convexity bound will be one fourth. Convexity, convexity bound is one fourth of the analytic conductor. Analytic conductor here is Q, here it's Q square, etc. So you could have used the convexity bounds also. But anyway, if you do that, you will get something A times Q to the power something. So if you just take the Q to the power to the other side, you will get that number. So we have uh, quite a few non vanishing, uh, simultaneous non vanishing, uh, you know. Uh, occurrences. So <clears throat> this was a simple corollary. So let me tell you one, tell a few words about the proof. As we see that the main point is this, this main term. This error term is not so important. Anything, any delta less than one will do here. So the main point is this, this number, this. <clears throat> so how to do that? Well, that is standard analytic number theory. So we use something called the uh, approximate functional equation. We use approx approximate functional equation for both of these objects, multiply them together, sum over chi. When I sum over chi, I will, uh, you know, detect by orthogonality some congruences, etc. And, you know, uh, as is the custom, the diagonal will give me the main term, and the off diagonal will me give me the error term. So it's very, in this case, it's very simple. It just works out like that, diagonal versus non-diagonal. <coughs> So we start with this sum. I have to detect even characters. So therefore, I introduce this uh, small thing. So this detects evenness, even characters. It will be 0 if chi is odd. <coughs> and then I just uh, apply my functional, uh, approximate functional equations, lambda fn. So lambda fn is the uh, eigenvalue under the Hecke operator chi of n, root n. There is some function here. So don't worry about this function. These are cutoff functions, um, n over q. So it's a big expression. Uh, but uh, yeah, so the essential idea was this multiplication of these Gauss sums. There's a square here. And uh, again, the same thing, but with a bar now, chi bar n by root n, same thing, over q, etc. So this is one times the other one for the, so this will be chi of m by root m, there will be other cut of function by root q plus there will be tau of chi. And I think I have put a bar, so I have to be careful. Uh, there will be, because I put a bar, so uh, there will be a bar into the half summation of chi of m root m v1 of m by root q, etc. So this, there are some, some, some standard stuff. So, <clears throat> so you write this as sum over chi s1 plus s2 into s3 plus s4 in the obvious way. <clears throat> so, look at, so this is S1 and this is S3. So, look at S1 into S3. I claim that that will give the main term. So look at S1, S3. In the sum S1 into S3, there is no Gauss sum. It's free of Gauss sums. So it's just this, something times something, and sum over chi. When you sum this over, so what? this is what you will get. 
one gets sum over chi star, etc. That means primitive mod q times lambda f n chi of n chi bar of m by root over m n times these functions. I didn't say what these are. I, I said these are cutoff functions. These are functions which are essentially uh, supported on very small numbers. So I can tell what these numbers are. For example, v1 of x is asymptotic to 1 when x is very small, when 0 less than x less than q to the power minus epsilon, and it decays otherwise. So it's essential. So therefore, this sum, this first sum, for example, uh, I wrote about v1, right? So therefore, this first sum is essentially supported on this range m q to the half plus epsilon. And similarly, this is supported on, uh, supported, in a, you know, it has a finite support essentially, n up to q to the 1 plus epsilon. So that's all it is. Because outside that range, it decays very rapidly. <coughs> so, uh, so you, yeah, you want to extract the main term from here. So when you sum over chi, you take the sum over, and there is sum over m and n, of course. So when you interchange the summations, take the sum over chi inside, you can get a congruence conditions. m is congruent to n from this ortho orthogonality. So sum over chi gives m congruent to n mod q. And this, and one can show that, uh, uh, and one shows that up to an error, <clears throat> q to the power something, uh, 3 by 4 plus theta plus epsilon, uh, n equals to m dominates. You know, it gives the mentor. Uh, survives. This one can show. This I can uh, tell you quickly how one can uh, get the main term now. So n, m is equal to n survives. Once it survives, let me tell you how I get the L1f. That's very simple. So and I think I'll stop with that. So, um, so S1, S3 essentially becomes Q minus uh, 2 by 2. Well, this Q minus 2, et cetera, comes from this orthogonality. There's a factor of Q and Q minus 1 comes. So Q minus 2, because the number of primitive characters is Q minus 2. And then sum n bigger than 1, lambda f n by n. Now root over mn has become n. <coughs> Whatever you have, v1 of n over Q, v2 of m over root Q, plus some error, some manageable error, manageable or admissible, acceptable. <clears throat> so this is, you have, but now what you can do is, is you can bring back the definitions of V, which I have not defined, but I'll just uh, ask you to believe me that uh, this, this functions V, which I had, uh, which I uh, described how they behave, they are defined by integrals. So you can bring back those integrals and put back, you know, whatever you had. So you'll have 1 plus S1 plus S2, uh, two variables for two functions, uh, Q pi to the power minus S1 by 2 minus uh, uh, I think this one will be S1, S2 by 2. Uh, I will not write, there is a ratio of gamma functions, st standard. Gamma functions, ds1 by s1, ds2 by s2. So essentially, you will get this. Now you do the usual business. You uh, you write this as q minus 2 by 2. You sh essentially, you want to shift the contours and pick up some poles. So <clears throat> this will be integral over 1, uh, l1, uh, 1 plus s1 plus s2, this bunch of gamma factors that I'm not writing, ds1 by s1, ds2 by s2. Well, this you can write because you are in the region of uh, convergence, because I can uh, replace this 1 by 300, whatever I want, right? So this you can write. Now you shift your contour to negative, 
and cross uh, to the past the origin. So you will pick up poles at S1 and S2, and that will give you L1, right? L1F. Yeah. Uh, sorry, this is not this is LF. So that will give you uh, L1F, and that will be Q minus 2 by 2 times L1, plus the other thing uh, uh, will go into the error term. That one can estimate. So I'm not doing that. <coughs> so it's shifting contours. Lines of integration and picking up poles at S1 equal to S2 equal to 0, we get the main term. So that more or less completes uh, uh, the picture how we get the main term. Then there is, of course, you have to prove that you have to we can push the other things into the error term. That uh, I'll just end my talk by stating how you can do that without going into any details. I think I have erased uh, all these S1. No, I have, I have this. So S1 times S3 is done. So this with this is done. And then the most difficult thing will be S2 times <clears throat> S3. So this will be the most difficult thing because you have a square of a Gauss sum and you have this. You know, this, this one will just give a single Gauss sum because there is tau chi bar and tau chi will cancel off. So this will be the most difficult uh, thing to um, consider. So, um, yeah. So, For S1, S4, and S2, S4, we have only one Gauss sum. So these are manageable. So here, you use square root cancellation. This Fourier, this eigenvalues are supposed to be behave like random variables, so they obey this square root cancellation law, which means that summation of lambda fn, n up to n, should be bounded by n to the half plus epsilon. This thing might depend on f and for epsilon positive. So you can use this uh, data and you can get handle over these two terms. And the difficult thing is uh, this s2 times s3. So here we have a square of a Gauss sum. Here you need some uh, uh, some more work. Essentially, you need something called the Voronoi summation formula. So this is handled by standard techniques, handled by Voronoi summation. I won't say what it is. It essentially uh, is a technique in analytic number theory which transforms, you know, uh, sums of the form. <clears throat> this essentially is, if you have some sums of the form lambda f n, you know, some you have some additive character, you know, modulo something, and uh, you have some weight function. Not say what it is. So you know, it will look like like this. F m by m and times this e of Ah, this is not a good notation. I have an m here, so I'll call it c. m c bar by q. Again, another function phi, depending on w, etc. The main point of this is that if this summation is supported, you know, uh, you know, essentially suppose this weight function is has such decay properties, so that this sum is essentially supported n up to n, then this will be supported from uh, on m to q square divided by n. So that is the main point of all this business. So, so in particular, if n is bigger than the half of this, then you then this uh, length is shorter. So you can shorten the range. Whenever the short the range is uh, length is bigger than q to the one plus epsilon, you can apply this trick or whatever this method, and you can shorten the range. So that's the trick, and that is widely used in analytic number theory. So in Treating three, you can use this uh, Voronoi summation formula, 
and you can get a good handle on the error turn. That's all I want to say. So, and you can put together all these things, and you will get what I wrote. You know, there, it needs some analysis, but you will get. Uh, fortunately, this is q to, q to the power something delta, where delta is less than one. That one can check. Yeah. So, I think I'll stop here. Thank you. <coughs> Oh, yeah. Sorry, 50 percent? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, so that's the natural density. I mean, you count the number, like you count the number of integers having a property up to x and divide by the number of integers up to x, the natural density. No, it's like uh, like number of primes, right? Number of uh, number of yeah integers have having some property n up to x divided by x. So this is the proportion. Suppose the, my set of integers has a property p, so I sum up to x those integers which have this property and divide by the number of integers up to x. So this is the this is something which is delta p and should be between one and zero, right? As x tends to infinity. That's the natural density. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. So now this p will be uh, that f is a new form. That's the property. And I have to divide not by x, but that uh, dimension, the number of new forms that I have to divide. Right? Yeah, so there is a formula for the number of new forms. It may not be the whole dimension of the space, it's a subspace. But uh, yeah, there are formulas. Yeah. For example, for SL to Z, everything is a new form, so it will just be the dimension. K, essentially K. So, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, the problem is that when you have the Q of a Gauss sum, you encounter something called hyper Klusterman sums. What is a Klusterman sum? Well, Klusterman sum is a summation of uh, x mod Q star P of mx plus nx bar by Q, etc. Now, what you, if you, this is this is what you get if you have a square of a Gauss sum, yeah, tau chi square. If you have tau chi cubed you get something called hyperclusterman, etc. So this will be something like, uh, essentially, E of A1 x1 plus A2 x2 plus A3 x3, etc. Uh, A1, A2, A3 is fixed, is fixed, something, co prime to Q, something like this. So it's a hyper three variable thing, so hyperclusterman. So, um, yeah. So bounds for this are known by Delin, but the point is the analysis is difficult. You cannot do it. You can, as I stand here and say, you can in fact do it by some very advanced result, very recent and advanced result. You can do this, but not at the time that we are aware of this. Yeah. Now you can do this. Yeah, yeah should work for for yeah. It is easier for holomorphic forms. Analysis will be easier. 